So we're going to start talking about the organic macromolecules that make up all living things. Organic compounds are compounds that contain carbon. That's what makes them organic. Now, they are also considered to be macromolecules. That's because they are large organic molecules. So that prefix macro means big. Now, carbon is the major element that identifies organic compounds. Carbon itself, remember, has four electrons in its outer shell. And when we studied that second energy level, we learned that there should be eight electrons to make that atom happy. So that means carbon is a great compound for forming covalent bonds with as many as four other atoms or elements. Usually, those covalent bonds are formed with carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, or nitrogen. For example, methane is a gas that's one of the byproducts when um, dairy cows eat hay. They produce a lot of methane gas during their digestive process. The carbon forms four covalent bonds, each of those electrons with a hydrogen. Now, come on, it's not coming up, screen's not working. Ah, there we go. So these macromolecules, again, they're large organic molecules. And another name for them is polymer. That prefix poly, that's what I want you to focus on right there. That prefix poly, that means many. That prefix is going to come up a lot in our notes today. So basically, a polymer is one of these large molecules that's made up of many smaller building blocks. And all of those smaller building blocks or repeating subunits are called monomers. Mono means one. So some examples are carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids like DNA and RNA. So the question is, how are macromolecules formed? Well, the answer is what we call dehydration synthesis. And that's kind of hard to understand but we also call it a condensation reaction. So when you think of condensation, what do you think of? Hopefully you think of water droplets forming. So this forms, um, I'm sorry, not this forms, this process, this type of chemical reaction forms polymers by combining monomers and removing water. So literally forming water. When we look at this example of a monomer, just two repeating subunits, and this simple monomer over here, notice how there is a hydrogen on this side and a hydroxide over here. Well, when those two portions combine, when they're removed, we get water. But then a, a chemical bond is formed in its place. So then you have to think about if that's how they're formed, how are they separated or digested? Because I don't know about you, but I like to eat carbohydrates and proteins and lipids. So exactly how do we digest them? How do we break them down so that we can actually get energy from them? Well, the answer here is a chemical reaction called hydrolysis. So if one of them we formed water, the other way, if we're breaking it down, would have to put water back in. So this one separates the monomers by adding water to it. So it's the exact opposite. We add water in place of that chemical bond, breaking it and putting the hydrogen and the hydroxide back on those, onto those monomers. So carbohydrates, a lot of people like carbs. Some people think that it's part of a big fad diet to not have carbs, but I'll tell you what, this is where we take small sugar molecules and we can utilize them for energy or they can be really big sugar molecules. It doesn't really matter. Some examples include a monosaccharide, a disaccharide, or a polysaccharide. So you should be recognizing that each of those examples has a prefix and the same suffix. Saccharide refers to sugar. So let's take a look at those prefixes and see what the difference is between those. A monosaccharide is one sugar unit. Mono, one. An example here is glucose, C6H12O6. 
This is a chemical formula that you're going to need to remember. We use it a lot in biology. Then there's deoxyribose, ribose, fructose, galactose. And when we look at the structure of glucose, remember how I said there were six carbons? They form what's called a carbon ring. So right here's where a carbon would be, right here's where a carbon would be. So there's three, four, five, and six. Now, what happens if they're a disaccharide? Di refers to two sugar units. So examples here include sucrose, lactose, and maltose. And they're formed because they are two simple sugars, two monosaccharides, combined to make a larger sugar molecule. So in this case, maltose is glucose and glucose. Now, polysaccharide means many sugar units put together. An example here are starches. So things like breads and potatoes. Now, glycogen is another example. Beef muscle. When you eat a nice steak or a juicy hamburger, you're eating glycogen. Then there's cellulose. Cellulose is found in the cell walls of all plant material. So when you eat lettuce and you have a nice salad or you have some corn on the cob, yum, that's when you're taking in cellulose. So you can see cellulose is an arrangement of glucose molecules all combined together, making a polysaccharide. Now let's look at lipids. Lipids are a general term for compounds which are not soluble in water. They are soluble in hydrophobic solvents. So remember, lipids are the group of organic macromolecules that store the most energy. One example here are fats. Then there are phospholipids. Phospholipids are fats that make up the cell membranes of every living cell on earth. Oils, waxes, as well as steroid hormones. Then there's triglycerides, right? We've heard about those. Those aren't very good for us. Now, there are six different functions of lipids. We want to remember that they are able to store the most energy for us. So what that does for us is it provides us with long-term energy storage. It also can help protect against heat loss. So Usually in the fall, people tend to add a couple of pounds, especially in the Midwest as it gets colder, and that's just your body adding more insulation. That insulation also can protect against physical shock. It can protect against water loss, as well as produce chemical messengers like hormones. And it, again, it's the major component of membranes, like your phospholipids. So triglycerides, um, those bad kind of lipids that we hear about with heart disease, are composed of one glycerol and three fatty acids. So this is what the glycerol looks like. And so as a repeating subunit, here's one fatty acid, here's another fatty acid, and there's the third one. They each look just a little bit different. And I want you to pay attention to that because there's the red fatty acids on there and the green ones. And there's two different kinds. So what we know when we look at a food label is that there's two different kinds of fats. There's what we call saturated fats in which there are no double bonds present. These are the ones that are bad for you. And then there's the unsaturated fatty acids. Those have double bonds. That means that they're good. So look here at the saturated. When you look all the way along this entire chain, there are no double bonds present. Those are the bad kinds. Then there's the unsaturated. And now this time as I look across, there's a double bond right there. This makes it an unsaturated fatty acid. Now, one way I've always remembered this is even if I don't have a food label to look at, if it's a solid at room temperature, it's a saturated fatty acid. They both start with an S. Saturated, solid. Unsaturated fatty acids are liquids at room temperature. So things like olive oil are better for you than, say, lard. You'll Just saying that makes me get sick. Now, we're going to start to look at the proteins. And proteins are also referred to as polypeptides. Poly. Boy, there's that prefix again. And it's poly because 
Basically, a protein are different amino acids stringed together to make a long chain. Now, there's 20 different kinds of amino acids. Your body can make 12, but you have to ingest the other eight. All of these amino acids then, each one linked together, is held together by what's called a peptide bond. So this is where they come up with the name polypeptide. There's six different functions of proteins. And you're probably familiar with a lot of them, but some of them you might not be. For example, proteins may be used for storage, like the albumin in an egg, or what we call the egg white, is actually storage for the growing embryo before it hatches. It could be transport. The hemoglobin on the surface of your red blood cells is a protein that helps bind to oxygen, enabling you to breathe and get oxygen to all of your cells. They could be regulatory, in which there are hormones produced. Could be for movement. Your muscles are made out of protein fibers. It could be structural. Your membranes, your hair, your nails. And then there are the enzymes. And the enzymes enable many cellular reactions to occur much faster than if they were left alone to happen by nature. So there's four different levels of protein structure. There's what's called the primary structure, secondary structure, or second level, tertiary structure, third level, and quaternary structure, fourth level. So let's check this out. The primary structure is basically the amino acids bonded together by peptides in a nice straight chain. So they kind of make like a train, if you will. Then there's the secondary structure. And this is where we start to see some three-dimensional folding or arrangement of that polypeptide. It could form coils or pleats and are held together by hydrogen bonds. One example is an alpha helix and the other one is called a beta pleated sheet. The blue dashed lines are what we would consider to be the hydrogen bonds. Now the tertiary structure is when the secondary structures get bent and folded into an even more complex 3D arrangement. So we might see additional hydrogen bonds, ionic bonds, disulfide bridges, and that's what we call a subunit. So now look at this tertiary structure here. Can you identify some of the secondary structures we just looked at? Can you see an alpha helix? Can you see a beta pleated sheet? Right there's an alpha helix, and right there's a beta pleated sheet. Now, the quaternary structure is composed of two or more subunits. There's glob they, they're very, very globular in shape, and typically form in aqueous environments. Some examples are enzymes. Hemoglobin exhibits this quaternary structure. It's very complex. So many of those subunits are put together then, to form the enzyme. Nucleic acids are the last group that we're going to look at. Nucleic acids could be one of two types, and I know you've heard of these before, deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA, and ribonucleic acid, or RNA. Nucleic acids are composed of long chains of nucleotides formed by dehydration synthesis. The nucleotides are the repeating subunit, or the monomer, and the nucleic acid itself is the polymer. So let's look a little bit more closely at that. The nucleotide, or that monomer, includes a phosphate group, a pentose sugar, a nitrogenous base, which could be adenine, thymine, but we only see that in DNA, uracil, that we only see in RNA, cytosine, Guanine. So the nucleotide itself has that phosphate group attached to that 5-carbon sugar. In this case, this one looks is deoxyribose. And then there's the nitrogenous base. And again, if it's DNA, could be A, G, C, or T. When we look at the actual double helix, we have a side portion of our ladder, which is the sugar and the phosphate. And there are two sides to that, which is why we call DNA a double helix. It's those nitrogenous bases that form hydrogen bonds right here in the middle 
that enable it to form kind of the ladder. And so then we see even more of those. Oops, I went too far. Sorry about that. That form the ladder that then gets twisted into that helical shape. So we'll study DNA a lot more um, towards the end of this quarter.